Galatians chapter 4. Verse 21, Paul says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically, These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Father, we are so thankful to have Your Word. And Lord, we're praying You bless this hour. I just think pastorally of a number of needs, a number of situations that could be addressed in the message and if you address one you don't address the other and lord i just we, we firmly believe that you're we have a responsibility to to preach and teach the whole counsel of god and lord so by faith i just want to proclaim this passage and trust you with the results and you would honor your word and you would bless it and take it in places and do things with it that i can't even conceive lord just pray exalt your son be with us by your spirit I ask these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Well, brethren, this this passage (laughs) really really makes me wish we were all Jewish. (laughs) Only because hearing these statements from a deeply ingrained Jewish heritage and lifestyle brethren, do you realize how incredibly offensive these words are? To Jewish ears. What Paul is saying here is dynamite. And the more I read Paul, the more I realize and understand why the Jews were constantly seeking to take him out. Why they stoned him. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. He only got stoned one time. At least that's what's recorded anyway. I mean, this man's writings and teachings albeit inspired by the Holy Spirit, they they were highly explosive and inflammatory towards the Jewish community because because of their spiritual ignorance and blindness. Paul started his scriptural argumentation here back in chapter 3, and and then he he veers off in chapter 4 to verses 12-20 through that we looked at in in the last two messages. Only return one more for one more argument from Scripture here. And, and wow, what an, what an argument this, this is. This is, uh, I mean, you talk about saving the best for last, um, the grand finale, having an ace up your sleeve. I mean, this, is like, this is like a walk off homer in the ninth or the seventh game of the World Series. I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. No one was prepared for what Paul has to say here. 
In verse 20 there, Paul, Paul speaks of changing his tone. <laughs> and as you consider, and you continue reading, you're, you're a bit alarmed thinking, tone? What, what about changing Scripture? <laughs> and some of you are probably sitting here, and I don't know how, much, how many messages you've listened to in your life. I mean, I realize that it's more frequent now that we have the internet, but perhaps you've heard hundreds of messages over the years, and this may be the very first time you've heard a message out of this passage. And I think that's for a few reasons. One, it's, it, it has some difficulties. Um, and secondly, it's not exactly dripping with personal applications and oh my, we, in, we live in the day where we've got to have some kind of personal application to take away with us. And, and, and thirdly, men just are uncomfortable about what it says and the implications of what it says. And I, I'll throw my hand in the air and say I, I'm one of them. <laughs> But I, but I in, intend to preach it. God, so help me. Paul now returns his focus here to Abraham. In chapter 3, verse 23 through 29, there we learned that all believers in Christ belong to Abraham's offspring by faith. In verse 26, and then into chapter 4, the verse 7 verses there, we learn that all believers are true sons of Abraham. Therefore, true sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ. And now Paul wants to not only reinforce those realities, he's going to do so exposing something, like I said, no one ever expected. So we're going we're gonna to jump into this. Verse 21. Let me tell you, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? <laughs> Paul, a bit of irony rolling off his, his tongue here or pen. Attention law lovers! Okay, you want to be so infatuated with the law? Let me make sure you properly understand something or informed about some matters regarding the law. And not from me. Not from rabbi so-and-so. Not from the Sanhedrin. Not from so-and-so's systematic theology. But the law itself. Let's go back to the basics, Paul says. Let's go back to the very beginning point. The very origins of the law. And then you're going to realize what a foolish proposition this is. Let's go back before Moses. How about Abraham? Verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now, now this is interesting, isn't it? Do, do you not listen to the law, Abraham? Paul mentions law twice here. But, but clearly he's referring to it in two different ways. And this is one, this is one of the reasons uh, why there's so much confusion that takes place regarding the law. It's a very complex subject. What exactly is being referred to? by the word law. It's not always easy to tell. The word law, translated in our text, it shows up 194 times in our New Testaments. And that's why it's always a relevant subject matter. It covers a lot of ink in the New Testament. And nearly every time you see this word law in the New Testament, it's the Greek word nomos. And nomos can be referring to the Mosaic Law which it does most of the time. But it can also be referring to all of the Old Testament Scriptures. It can also be referring to a simple rule or a principle or a standard. And we're left to interpret it based upon the context in which it's being used. Here Paul is referring to the Mosaic Law in his first use. And we know that because that's, this has become the central focus of the letter. But in his second use, he takes us back to Abraham before the Mosaic Law was given. Why would Paul call that law? Because law, nomos, does not always refer to the Mosaic Law. In this instance, he would be referring to the Old Testament Scriptures. Paul, Paul is saying, you who desire to be under the law of Moses, how about we go back to the Old Testament Scriptures to see what it has to say. Let's see what light the Scripture sheds upon this thing of the Mosaic Law. So, verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. 
Here are these Judaizers. What are they pushing? What are the Judaizers trying to convince these Galatians they need to be doing? Yeah, circumcision. And what do we have here? We have two sons. One a, a, a slave from a slave woman, and the other an heir from a free woman. Both of them were circumcised. So, so right away this gets very interesting. It's as if Paul's saying, just in case you didn't buy into my pre-circumcision argument back in chapter 3, how about we talk about Abraham's sons whom both were circumcised? Verse 23, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. This obviously is a reference to Hagar and Sarah. No one in Jerusalem, listen, no one would have considered themselves in any way, shape, or form a part of Israel or a part of Ishmael, Hagar's son. The Jews were not descendants from the slave boy Ishmael. They were descendants of Isaac, the heir, the son of promise. We are of Abraham's children. We were never, we'd never been enslaved by anyone. They were proud to, to remind Jesus in John chapter 8, right? You remember that? They took great pride in being Abraham's children through Isaac. Yes, the physical line of the Jewish people, they trace their lineage, and rightly so, back to Isaac. That is correct. Which makes Paul's comment here rather startling. However, before we get into this, I know some of us here are very familiar with the story back in Genesis, but some are not. And either way, I think it would be most beneficial to approach this text with this historical backdrop most fresh in our minds. So please turn with, with me to Genesis chapter 12. I say most fresh, but today's message is primarily going to be a review of what Paul's ref- referencing. And, and by the time I get back to the next message, because we have these breakups, it's, it's going to be a few weeks. But we will get into the Galatian text deeper in our next message. Genesis chapter 12. This is where this whole thing begins. Verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your, and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went and the Lord, as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So here the Lord makes this initial promise of this promised heir, seed, offspring. And he promises him this land as well that this offspring was going to inherit this very land that Abraham was standing upon. And it's often the case, the Lord makes a promise, (laughs) and then He tests the faith that's trusting in that promise, right? Abraham, you see the land? It's yours. Your offspring's going to own it, dominate it, inherit it all. Verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. The Lord promises Abraham the land, and then follows that promise by basically decimating the land so bad that he had to evacuate it. And he also tests Abraham and Sarah's faith concerning this promised heir, this promised child, this promised offspring. 
Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Abraham is just returning from rescuing Lot. After these things, verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. I I can't read that without the King James. I I, I had that (laughs) memorized. I am I am your shield, and and thou art I am their shield, and your exceeding great reward. I love that passage. Brethren, that's said to you and me. Your God has said that to you. I am your shield and exceeding great reward. What a comfort that is to a child of God. Verse 2, but Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? Now, the Lord just tells him, he says, exceeding great reward. And he says, shield, what will you give me? What will you give me? Because I continue childless. And the heir of my house, Eliezer of Damascus. What about this guy? I got him. And Abram says, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So basically, Abram is pretty bold here. He's basically telling the Lord. I mean, he's got a lot to learn, doesn't he? He's not the one calling the shots. Lord, I got this, this guy in my household. I'm gonna make, you know, he's the heir. Let's make him the heir. The Lord says, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and he said, Come here, boy, we're going to show, I'm going to show you something. Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Now, that's pretty staggering. He didn't grow up in the city like we got. I mean, he's out there in the dark of night looking at these starlit sky. There's your offspring, Abraham. Keep in mind, he's childless at 75. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. I say 75, but actually it was 85. I mean, some time had passed here. I mean, it seems this account kind of bleeds into the next chapter. So, So if 10 years had passed... I mean, it's been 10 years since the Lord first told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to to give you this this heir. And now He's pointing up in the sky and saying, your offspring's going to be this. And so, I mean, it's been 10 years. He's he's got to be scratching his head. And yet, God gave him faith to believe it. Brethren, don't lose heart. Trust in the promises of God. (laughs) We sing it, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense. But trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. That's what the Lord was calling Abraham to do, to trust Him despite what providence had been revealing, despite ten years lag in, this, in the delivery of this promise. Let me ask you, has the, has the Lord given you promises, Christian? Promises that you're still waiting to receive from the Lord? And I'm not talking general promises you know, that are gloriously true for every Christian. I'm talking about promises that God has made personal to your very own soul. Promises that have leaped off the page of His Word kind of like there in verse 2 to me, to your very own soul. Written on your heart that you by grace have laid hold of by faith and you're waiting for the Lord, you're waiting for an answer. I mean, do you know of any such thing? Do you even think in such ways? Brethren, I hope we don't go so far in our, you know, rightly rejecting our this name it and claim it nonsense that we dismiss the Lord using his word to speak in very personal, direct, and pointed ways to his people. I mean, do you read your Bible anticipating, waiting to hear from God? hoping to hear Him speak to your soul? Or is it just this mechanical exercise that we, we go through? And I understand there are dry times in, in reading Scripture. I think far too many actually. Sadly, that is part of the Christian experience. But is, is, God, is, is God's Word ever move you to lay hold of God for something in, it, in unique fashion? Trusting Him for some unique blessing. 
Well, that's exactly what happened to Abraham here. I mean, no, it wasn't often. But we find these occurrences in his life where the Lord draws near, manifests Himself to him, speaking a word of promise, a word of blessing to him. It was nothing Abraham willed into being. He didn't muster this up. He didn't fabricate it. It was something the Lord engineered. And the Lord would periodically remind him so he wouldn't lose heart. I'd like to encourage you today, don't lose heart if God's given you a promise. I'm telling you. Oftentimes, He brings the famine to try it. To try your faith in the midst of it. But God is true to His promise. There's not one promise the living God has ever broke. Ever. Sadly, our friend Abraham here, his faith gives way to his flesh. Well, we are declared, it does declare quite clearly in the Scripture that Abraham did express faith. In fact, that's Paul's argument back there in Galatians. This is the kind of faith that, that's required. But it doesn't mean it's always steady and constant, right? Abraham fails here to give way to his flesh. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So, so Scripture gives us this, this window here of really some female drama going on in the household of Abraham. I mean, growing up with no brothers in a house of females, this is, this is not an unfamiliar scene to me. I mean, this has all the makings of some great reality TV. Right? I mean, you got two women under the same roof vying for the same man's affections and attention. I mean, this thing's filled to the brim with brewing over with jealousy. I mean, you can just feel the tension in this story. And man, this is, this is uh, our what not to do as a man 101. One, don't yield to bad counsel. Ter terrible counsel by Sarai. Sarai. Abram listened to his wife and not God. Secondly, don't cohabitate with more than one woman. I mean, the warning's on full display here, right? I mean, this is a really bad idea. God's design for marriage of one man and one woman, I mean, God knows best, doesn't He? And poor Abraham learned this the hard way. In a day before Tylenol and ibuprofen. You see, once you move away from God's designs, you begin flirting with trouble, with disaster in your life. But once you fail to trust God and you start taking matters in your own hands, and that, that's what happened here. And when you do that, you're, you are really certain for a hurting. It's going to happen. Again, a, a decade had gone by here. Since God had promised, I grant you, that's a long time. A decade had gone by since God promised Abraham a son. Abraham, listen, Abraham was already 75 years old. I mean, that's pushing it for a father, right? At 75? When God first called him, well, now he's childless at 85. Poppy still got nothing on you, right? <laughs> but, but God has promised. 
God said, I will. But here sits Abraham and Sarah and their bodies are saying, I won't. And so instead of looking to God for an absolute miracle that He's promised, that's what this would require. You see, even at the very beginning stages of God making a people for Himself, it required the miraculous. It's, it's marked by the supernatural. But, but instead of looking to God, Abraham and Sarah became self-reliant. They focused on what they could or couldn't do. That's what Paul means when he says the son of the slave woman according to the flesh. That's what he's referring to. Is this right here. He's referring to Abraham and Sarah's self-reliance. At this moment anyway, they left off trusting God and, and went their own way. And you can imagine this, right? There they're sitting outside their tent, you know, 85, 75 years of age. Or they're looking at each other, looking at their bodies, looking at their wrinkles and all. And, you know, it's been a long journey. And they're still empty handed. She's still childless. And Sarah's faith starts failing her. It's a long time. And her body's telling her, this can't happen. Now, I, I know what God said to me, but I mean, look at me for crying out loud. No, I mean, no one, no one at my age conceives and brings forth children. I mean, that was true. But God had promised, didn't He? This is going to require a supernatural work of God. Do, do you hear the gospel in this already? <laughs> Regeneration in seed form right here. Already being preached to us from Scripture. Sarah's mind though is not fixed on God anymore. It gets removed from the promise. The promise that she just couldn't see. And it gets anchored in the things she could see. It gets anchored in her own flesh and not her God. Not only am I, she just starts thinking, not only am I past the age of childbearing, but I'm having a hard time as it is just getting up and getting around this tent and this old dilapidated tent trying to take care of it and all the washings and all the meals and so forth. And and then she's at this, she's all discouraged, she's battling her fate, talking herself up, and she glances out in the field and there she sees the well-abled body of Hagar tending the sheep. And the thought comes to her mind, now, she could bear a child for me. So sadly, Sarah, growing impatient, losing faith in the promise, turns to Abraham and says, have you ever considered my servant Hagar? And Abraham wisely says, who? (laughs) Which one is she, honey? (laughs) There's no indication that Abraham's resisting the plan here, right? Right? I mean, she didn't exactly twist his arm. At the end of verse 2, Abraham told, we're told Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. I mean, there's, this, there's flesh all over this thing. So, so Sarah's fleshly wisdom that suggests God needs our help in performing and fulfilling His own promises, uh, that wisdom prevails. Hagar's involvement here is an expression of self-reliance. They decided to do what they could do without relying upon God. Oh, brethren, this is a message all on its own. Self-reliance. The enemy of trusting God. And I think it's one of the greatest enemies of American Christendom. And I'm not talking about uh, just false professing Christians. I'm talking about real, true Christians. Self-reliance. But brethren, we can so easily lean on the arm of our own flesh and look to and for all the human resources that are made available. And there's many made available to us today. We can look to that and just completely cut the Lord out of the equation in decisions that we make in life. Without even knowing it really. And if God never put us in situations of absolute need, we'd be in real trouble. We'd be in trouble because we just trust our own, we just tend to trust our own self-sufficiency. Remember Paul's 
second letter to the Corinthians, speaking of when he's speaking about the afflictions that were laid upon him there in Asia. He says in 2 Corinthians 1.8, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That's a trial. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Now, why on earth would God do that to His people? I mean, He loves Paul. His hand's upon him. I mean, it sounds like abandonment, doesn't it? I mean, I, I thought God loved His people. Yes, He does. And that's precisely why He brought him into a state of desperation for him. It was to direct Paul to God, to Him and not to Himself. Paul continues, but that was to make us not rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Because the Lord didn't want us doing the very same thing Abraham and Sarah did here. Trusting our own devices to get what we think we need. And see, Paul was, Paul was able to testify, He delivered us from such a deadly peril and will deliver us, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You see, God put Paul in this great need because this great need was designed to get him to discover how great his God was. It was, it was designed to get him to see how great God's faithfulness is to His people. That in the end, they will greatly praise His name. And Paul's experience of being able to trust God in this situation and see the Lord come through, it only strengthened his faith for the things that lay before him. The things he had yet to encounter. That's how he could say, He will yet deliver us again. Paul knew that based on the confidence of God's faithfulness of helping them when they cried out to Him and they looked to Him. They didn't rely upon themselves. Well, Abraham and Sarah are not there at this juncture of their journey anyway. They've decided to not rely upon God. They decided to rely upon their own flesh. And no sooner does Sarah suggest it and boom, this plan's put into action. I mean, Hagar becomes Abraham's wife. Verse 4, and he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Oh, brethren, we, we reap what we sow in this life. And sometimes our misery is, is directly due to our poor and regretful choices. Listen to me, children. And this applies for adults too. But children, don't think you know better than God's Word. You will reap what you sow. And don't think you know better than your parents. Oh, that's the blind pride and foolishness of neglecting and rejecting godly parental counsel. To think you know better than them. I so clearly remember <laughs> the words of one of my children, and I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> telling me after I warned them about what lay in store for them in this wicked and evil world that they just couldn't wait to jump into and be part of. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to give them everything they ever thought they wanted and, and more. And they told me this Dad, I hear what you're saying, but I need to experience it myself. <laughs> that, those words hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I knew what they didn't know. I knew the promises extended to me and my children while they're under my roof, and I knew exactly what was awaiting them outside that protection. The deceit of thinking, I know better. I can handle this. That, uh, that's other people, it's not me. That comes right out of the pit of hell. What you're saying will happen, i got news for you. It ain't going to happen with me. Oh, pride cometh before a fall. The God of this world blinding the youth of this world with self-reliance. I see it all over the place. And thankfully, the Lord did have mercy and rescued my child from really what led to a vortex of great darkness in their life. But countless young people take this bait. We see, it, we see it on the campus every week. 
I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where, yeah, my, my, my parents were Christians, or, or I was a Christian, or you know, I was taught the Bible, but you see, I've, well, you know, I've, I've gotten a little bit more wise than the Bible. I'm, I'm now an agnostic. I'm so wise, I have no idea about anything. that Anything can be definitively named to be God. And, and, and I really don't know anything for sure. But, uh, you know, you see, this just best fits my life, my love for sin and my lifestyle of sin. So I've, I've gladly adopted this philosophy into my life because it's pleasing to me. I don't know anything for sure, but, but yet I, I, I seem to be a know-it-all. I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but the... But the the agnostics I've run onto campus, it's like they don't, they can't, nothing's definitive, nothing's real. Like they don't really know anything, but they sure sound like they know everything. Anyway, getting back to Sarah's poor idea put into action here, she, she reaped what she sowed. She sowed in Abraham's ears. How about Hagar? Oh, that came back with much regret. Hagar conceives right away, and Sarah has one of those, oh no, I I really messed up moments. It's amazing that Hebrews 11 exonerates this woman. (laughs) By faith, that's, that's what it says, by faith, Sarah received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered Him faithful who had promised. But that wasn't happening here, was it? Praise God, no doubt she laments and repents of this afterwards. But but right here, Scripture allows us to peer in and see Sarah in one of her lowest, weakest moments. Her faith giving way to fleshly wisdom. And the fruit of it had a very bitter taste. And children, as parents, that's what we're after. To spare you the bitter taste of the lies of this world. There are consequences to sin. We would spare you of that. And I love how Scripture is just real to life. Don't you? I I mean, it doesn't hide the failures of those whom, whom God sets His love upon and even exalts. I mean, to me, that's a source of great comfort and, 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 and hope and, and it's an instruction for us. No sooner, though, has she turned turned her slave over to to Abraham there, and this thing just blows up in her face. When she saw that she had conceived, she she looked with contempt on her mistress. I mean, Hagar finds out she's pregnant, and suddenly the pride just elevates. I mean, she she starts thinking herself above her, uh, even though she's still her slave. She starts looking at Sarah with contempt, and no doubt she was treating her likewise. And this pregnancy was a game changer in the household. Before, she was certainly beneath Sarah. There wasn't any issues there. But now, not only did Hagar have Abraham as her husband, but Hagar had something Sarah did not. Not just something, somebody. Abraham's child. And she was not shy about letting Sarah know about it. And you know this amounted to more than just a simple look. You you know, Sarah, it'd be a it'd be a shame if I miscarried during the the harvest season. If I, you know, was working too hard, it's pretty hard work out there. You know, all the intensity and the demands of that labor. And you know, I talked to Abraham about that, and he said I should I should go on light duty and you know, maybe just work a couple hours in the morning. You know, know, that's gonna I'm sorry, but that's gonna leave you with a tremendous amount of work. And she's smirking about it later. No doubt, as, as this tension increases between them, these kind of chess moves are, are, are happening. And, and Sarah just finally vents on Abraham. May the wrong done to me be on you. Yeah, I, I, I know it was my fault, but somehow Abraham, it's your fault. I know it's my suggestion, but it's, it's bad enough I can't bear children for me. Now i got my own slave parading herself around the tent like she's some queen whistling zippity doo and, and smirks and mocking me. And I can't even bear to look at her, Abraham. And Abraham just takes the easy road here. <laughs> he just wants to stay out of the drama. Verse 6, Behold, your servant is in your power to do as you please. And so Sarah does. She deals with her harshly. 
So harshly she flees from the home. I mean, the passivity of Abraham's leadership here is on full display. And the consequences are not good. First of all, he, he completely buys into this fleshly scheme of helping God out with His promise without consulting the Lord Himself. And then he just, you know, he just complies to it. And then instead of standing up for what now is his second wife, I mean, Hagar is his wife. Instead of standing up for her and protecting her and considering her welfare, he just nonchalantly says, yeah, go, go ahead and do whatever you want with her. And so Sarah turns up the harshness. So much so, Hagar flees with really nowhere to go. But the Lord was watching all this take place. And He has pity on her. And He assures her that He's going to bless her and multiply her and just you know, kind of encourage her to go back and submit to Sarah. And she does. She obeys the Lord, returns. Verse 15, Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of the son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar born Ishmael to Abram. So this is 11 years later. Then the Lord appears again to Abraham and reminds him of his promise starting in chapter 17. And in case, you know, in case Abraham had some kind of foolish notion that uh, this little plan that he and Sarah came up with was somehow acceptable to God, and Ishmael really did serve as the promised heir or the fulfillment of the promise. And so the Lord comes and reminds him again. He changes his name from Abram to Abraham. He implements the covenant of circumcision in the first half of chapter 17, to which Abraham responds by circumcising both himself and Ishmael at the end of the chapter at the age of 99 and 13. So another 13 years had passed. 24 years in total had passed since God first promised Abraham a son. I mean, what a test. What a trial. Let's jump in the middle of, of this chapter, verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you! God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So now we at least got a time. We got a year down. At least we know the year now, right? 24 years though had passed since God had first promised Abraham this. And he reminds him that the promise is going to be through Sarah. And Abraham just falls down laughing. <laughs> you tell me my wife's going to have a baby? I, me, 100 years old. My wife, 90. We're going to have a child. I mean, Lord, I mean, I love my wife, but look at her. She's no spring chicken. Chick like, look at that. I mean, this woman has some miles on her. She's going to bear a child. That's impossible. That is impossible. 100 years old, impossible. Again, you, you hear the gospel in this? <laughs> With man, this thing's impossible. But Abraham's so bent on the flesh. God says, good. Now that you're thoroughly convinced, thoroughly convinced it's impossible, I'm going to do it. Oh, that Ishmael might live before. He just, he's just, he just won't let it go. 
No, no, Abraham, no. Sarah's going to bear a son. It's going to happen a year from now. It's happening. It's, and guess what, Abraham? The joke's on you and Sarah. You want to laugh at me? Okay. I'll laugh at you by making you name your son He Laughs. That's what Isaac means. Don't, don't think God doesn't have a sense of humor. I, I think there are multiple implications in that name. God laughing. His promised people laughing. And as we'll read in a moment, the people of Sarah's day laughing. Laughing at how in the world this, God made this, this woman a mother. It's, it's such an improbable age. Well, chapter 21, it finally comes to pass. Yes, we, we do find another hiccup of faith in chapter 20. And praise God, brethren, all these hiccups, isn't it a comfort to your soul? I mean, God doesn't deal with us according to our sin. What an incredible blessing that is. He already had the issue in Egypt. Now he basically repeats the same thing with Abimelech. But the Lord corrects the matter, comes in much grace and kindness, and we get to chapter 21, the birth of Isaac. The Lord visited Sarah, and he said, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And this is exactly the quote that Paul pulls into Galatians. It's a prophetic word. This is a prophetic word coming out of Sarah's mouth here. Verse 11, And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. There's a lot of things we could pull out here, but what a statement by the Lord there, right? Whatever Sarah says to do, do as she tells you. Wait, wait a minute. Isn't this the woman that created the whole mess? By telling me to do something I shouldn't have agreed to? Yeah, it, she is. But God says, do as she says. <laughs> I mean, one thing to pull from that, brethren, just because you, get, just because someone, uh, you receive bad counsel from someone doesn't mean their input is worthless, right? Now, Paul, Paul uses the word persecuted back in Galatians, speaking of how Ishmael treated Isaac. So, so there was more here than just laughter that took place. And in fact, Brian Borgman, I was listening to him on, the, <laughs> on this text, he suggests, he suggests that um, Ishmael was probably putting Isaac in a headlock and rubbing noogies on his head and, or pulling his arm behind his back until he cried uncle and you know, all these kind of trouble, bo troublemaking stuff that boys do. Whatever the case, Ishmael was not playing the friendly brother here. I mean, his attitude of laughing and mocking and picking at Isaac, it just, it got, it just reached a point where, where mom said, enough! Out of here! I've, I've had it! 
I've had it with this kid. And, and, you know, the Lord comes to Abraham and says, Abe, listen, when mom's happy, everybody's happy. When mom's, when mom's not happy, no one is. And so in order to rectify this situation, let, let's get Hagar and let's get Ishmael out of here. And, and poor Abraham. I mean, let, let's face it. Fr- from the surface here, this does not look like a good suggestion either, does it? I mean, Abraham, I want you to take your wife and your, and your boy, you know the ones that are completely dependent on you. Absolutely dependent. I want you to take them and, and cast them out of the house and just throw them into the wilderness. Well, that sounds like a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll take that counsel. Now, that's not exactly fateful home leadership 101, is it? It's not. I mean, if I'm Abraham, I'm displeased too. And yet the Lord takes up for Sarah. He does because there's more at play than just this relationship. He agrees with her, the Lord does. But he comes along the side the conflicted Abraham here and he assures him that he will see to it that Hagar and Ishmael are cared for. He doesn't have to be feeling like he's irresponsible. But still, I mean, aside from the fact of that, I mean, this is son. This is wife. And, and, and this has got to be a very heartbreaking moment for Abraham. And yet, despite that, he obeys the Lord. Now, please turn back to Galatians. There's a reason why the Lord did this. A significant one. going on here. Galatians 4:24 Now this all that we just looked at in Galatia, in Genesis that's what this is referring to here in this this Now this may be interpreted allegorically These women are two covenants. So so Paul suddenly goes John Bunyan on us in verse 24. Talking allegory. However, while while Bunyan's allegory was, was displaying spiritual truth through fictional characters, Paul's taking actual historical individuals and events and pulling them into the New Testament to show us spiritual truth. Amazing, really. And like I said, buckle up. <laughs> this, no one was expecting this. And this is where the dynamite comes into play. Nobody in that first century, or even in us today, if, if, unless we knew, you know, we already know the story kind of thing. But, but no one would have ever anticipated what Paul says here next. Not, not in a thousand years. This has got to be one of the most inflammatory statements made ever to the Jews. And this is why I wish we were Jews peering into this passage here with Jewish minds. The, the mention of covenants here would have automatically had their, the, the Jewish mind locked into the Abrahamic covenant. And there was no doubt there were some Jews scattered in the church that I, I would have every reason to believe the Judaizers, which, who Paul's addressing here, uh, which is the cause of this whole letter, we're also sprinkled throughout hearing this. But up to this point of the ink that's been shared and declared to the church, they're fully expecting to be identified with Sarah in the comparison of these two women. Why? Because she actually is physically the mother of them all. She was. But but what does Paul say? One is from Mount Sinai. Oh yeah, Sarah, you go, Mom. Wait, 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 wait. Bearing children for slavery. What? Bearing children for slavery? She is Hagar. Hagar? 
Hagar's not the mother of the heir. She's not the mother of the son of promise. But Paul, you're out of your mind. I mean, you, you're burning the late midnight oil writing this letter. Are you, you, sure you, you sure you could see well? Did you write this down right? I mean, are you ty- is this some kind of textual variant? In case you thought it was, verse 25. Now Hagar, he repeats it, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. Now them, some fighting words right there. Paul, has that stony knocked some, some, some screws loose in your head? This just can't be. I mean, of all the stunning statements of this letter, this, this has to top them all. Brethren, do you hear what Paul's saying here? He's equating Mount Sinai, the place where God met Moses, to slavery. That's what he's saying here. Amazing stuff. Paul says that. No, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just repeating Paul. In one sense, that really shouldn't shock us because back in chapter 3, verse 23, we find out that we're all held captive under this law, right? I mean, we went over that. And the law served as this pedagogos, this, this disciplinary, this guardian until Christ came. We talked about that. But Sinai, slavery, Think about what Paul's suggesting here. He's drawing our attention to two covenants linked to two women. And that's not really confusing. I mean, he's talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The old one that began with Moses on Mount Sinai where God spoke to Moses and established a covenant with this physical nation, this ethnic Israel, who were the direct descend- they were the direct descendants from Abraham and Sarah. All these Jews. Not Hagar. But shockingly, Paul attributes this covenant not to Sarah, but to Hagar. Why? Well, he tells us why in verse 25. Because she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Paul is linking Hagar to the present Jerusalem because she's a slave. And her son's a slave. Essentially, he's suggesting the Jewish people were, are, and always have been slaves. Both physically and spiritually. And I'm going to leave you hanging right there. (laughs) Only because I don't have time to develop it. But but there there is a takeaway for us here. As we wrap up, the problem with these Judaizers and the unbelieving Jews, any any really, any unbeliever, it's the the very same problem we see take place with Sarah and Abraham. The problem of self-reliance. It's a problem they did overcome and repent. But they thought the promise plus something else, didn't they? The promise was, was God plus their little contribution. The Judaizers were no different. They thought Jesus is the answer. But you see, you've got to have Jesus and, and, and the knife too. Or, or Jesus and, and plus just a little bit of law. Just a little. And brethren, the, the, it's, the in, it's endless what the plus sign is. We got religion all over the world will gladly lay hold of Jesus. But unless you're embracing Christ crucified in Him alone, His, His finished work on that cross as your full sufficiency before the, the holy God of, of heaven, you have no hope before Him. It's not Jesus' atoning work plus something you do. Any contribution that you add. What are you relying on? You, you do yourself no service to ignore that question. You, you don't want to leave here today not knowing the answer. You, you, really want to, you really want to take this in. What am I really relying on? It's an eternal question with eternal consequences. Are you relying on God's promised provision, His Son, Jesus Christ? 
Or are you really relying on Jesus plus there's something else? My, my attendance, my feelings, a prayer. I was excited one time. That there was this moment. Well, I got the baptism certificate, you know, and I, you know, I was, uh, my, my, dad's, my dad's a pastor. And I, I mean, people, you'd be amazed what slips out of people, what they're really trusting in. Well, I'm trying. I believe when I, I, I you know, when I get there, I, I, you know, I talk to people that you, you think were Christians. What is your hope when you stand before God? Well, I really hope at the end I, I've done enough. I really hope I've trusted enough. I really, it's all about them. If your answer comes back to you, you're in trouble. <laughs> There's only two religions in this world. Only two. A religion of bondage and a religion of freedom. True freedom. Absolute freedom. You have Hagar or the way of Cain. A way built upon self-reliance, self-sufficiency, self-accomplishment. And then there's Sarah. The way of Abel. It's the way of faith. A way of complete abandonment of self and complete reliance upon the God who made me and His provision for my soul, Christ. Only two. And one, of course, is true Christianity. The other is everything that is not true Christianity. I'll close by quoting. We we sung it. Luther's words, Therefore, my trust is in the Lord and not in my own merit. On Him my soul shall rest. His Word upholds my fainting spirit. His promised mercy is my fort. That's my stronghold. That's my anchor right there. My comfort and my sweet support. I bid you to trust in Christ today. You don't want to leave this world without Christ. Savingly knowing Jesus Christ and trusting Him and Him alone as your only hope for eternal life. As your only hope for a covering for your sin. We all need one. You won't be able to ever do it. You can't do enough to appease God. Jesus Christ has done it all. And Father, we are so thankful He has. Lord, I... Just going through this study, Lord, just realizing the exposure that these Jewish people had and yet remained in darkness. And Lord, that You would be pleased in the fullness of time on the other side of the globe, years, centuries later, consider my soul that You would allow Sarah to be my mother. That I might know the covenant blessings of Abraham. Well, all to You we owe. And we praise You for such kindness and mercy. Lord, You stood before Your own people and said, these things are hidden to them. But You've revealed them unto us. And we praise You and we thank You. Lord, help us live in the light of the wondrous Gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, have mercy on our children, lost loved ones here and visitors that are outside of Your grace. Lord, rain down in mercy upon them. Please open their eyes and their hearts to believe and receive the forgiveness of Your Son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.